If you're a perfectionist, that's your worst enemy for the GMAT. Welcome to NBA Pod TV. I'm your host, Mia Saini. The verbal part of the GMAT is just as important as the quant section. And if you're like me and you find that quant comes a little bit more easily to you than the verbal side, sit back, relax, and watch this video. Joining me are two GMAT whizzes from GMAT Prep Company, Manhattan GMAT. We have Steve Shaheen, an LA-based GMAT instructor who happened to breeze by with a score of 750. And we also have Chris Ryan, Director of Product and Instructor Development, who scored an incredible 790. They'll share everything they know on how to master the verbal section of the GMAT. There are three types of questions on the verbal section, which lasts 75 minutes and has 41 questions. And by the way, comes always after the math section. So it's the final part of your GMAT. Those 41 questions, you'll see roughly one third of each type, a few more of a type called sentence correction, where you're correcting a sentence according to rules of good grammar and style. There are also critical reasoning questions on which you draw a conclusion or find an assumption in an argument or you strengthen and weaken that argument. And the other type is called reading comprehension, which is you read a passage and then you answer questions about it. If you want to get a good verbal score, you really need to nail the sentence correction. The, by far the biggest mistake people make with that is that they, uh, they trust uh, their little friend here, they trust their ear, which is deadly because there's lots of things that in everyday speech, like I'm talking to you, that sound fine, but then when you actually go into the, uh, you know, the, the famous English grammar rule book, they're, uh, they're completely wrong. So I'll give you an example of that. So I'm a big sports fan. So. So I like sports, um, I enjoy sports like baseball and tennis. Completely wrong, completely wrong, okay? You need to say, I enjoy sports such as baseball and tennis. You can get probably up to a 600, maybe even higher, trusting your ear. If you wanna get into the top tier, you need to learn the rules and memorize the rules. Knowing correct grammar is the key to acing the verbal section of the GMAT. It's been said that non-native English speakers score higher on sentence completion as compared to native English speakers because they've always had the opportunity to learn proper English from the get-go. Now we'll go through a few more GMAT verbal tips in a minute, but first let's hear from one of my classmates at the Harvard Business School on his experience with the GMAT. I think, I, I think the thing is, is that the GMAT is something that you can start really low and if you just put a lot of time into, your uh, score goes up. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, I, I was very fortunate in, in, in being able to do that. I do think one of the unfair things about the GMAT is that the GMAT classes are vital. Okay. And so, at least in my person, in my experience, did I did Manhattan GMAT. Okay. Um, and I think it would be impossible without that course. I had heard a lot of good things about Manhattan GMAT from people that got into the business schools they wanted mm -hmm. to go to. Um, and so that's kind of how I ended up there. I had a great instructor who made dry material interesting, <laughs> right. and so you know pushing through those like I forget what they were three hour classes right. or something it wasn't wasn't that horrible. Um, but the most important thing is just getting the test in front of you, learning what's going to be on the test, and then just drilling. You know I think the curve you know they give you practice tests so you mm -hmm. at least know how you're doing, and those the Manhattan practice tests were very very accurate and similar to the uh, actual test, um, but. The curve wasn't through the class. It, the big spike was after you just start drilling and sure. doing the practice, sure. which the class prepares you to do. So the GMAT, in my opinion, is the farthest thing in the world from an IQ test. The GMAT, really, at the end of the day, is all pattern recognition. So the more time you put in learning the content, learning the patterns, the more your score is going to go up. I tell people, like, you can take a class, right, and that's great. That's going to help you. But at the end of the day, it's really what you do on your own. Like if somebody teaches you how to shoot a jump shot, right? That's great. You might know it in your head, how to do it really well. Till you get out on the court and you practice it 10,000 times and it becomes second nature, it's useless. That's what the GMAT is too. Where I can teach you something, that's great, but you need to do it, you know, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times to get it to be second nature. And when you get enough of those patterns in your head, then yeah, your score goes up significantly. 
the number one thing you can do in critical reasoning is if I, if I sit here and I make some kind of argument to you, whether it's about politics or economics or, or whatever, um, I can go through and talk for you know, 20, 30 seconds on that. The key thing is for you to be able to find what was the point of what I just said. Right? And sometimes that's hard to do because it gets dressed up in a lot of sentences. So can you take something that's somewhat complicated and just dissect what is the main point? And, and in GMAT speak, we call that the conclusion. So if you can find the conclusion, you're in really good shape for critical reasoning. Reading comp, I have a nice uh, rule that I use with my students. I always tell people if um, I have to get on my soapbox for a second here, is um, whenever somebody talks to you about something, typically the more buzzwords they use and the longer they speak, the less they know what they're talking about. At least that's what I've found in my life. So, so for reading comp, I always tell, if you can take a long passage and you can put it into one sentence, so very concise, as if you're talking to a child, like you're talking to your kid brother, if you can do that, it forces you to comprehend it. So that's a big thing for reading comp. At Harvard Business School, I spend many, many, many hours poring over case after case after case. On some days, I'm responsible for reading three to four cases, and one case could easily be over 20 pages. So it might be helpful for you to know that as you prepare for the verbal section, you're also preparing for business school. Now, if you found the verbal section of the GMAT a little challenging, here are some tips that could help you. If you're underperforming on verbal, it could be for a variety of reasons. But one extra thing I'd throw in there is because the verbal section is last, what could be happening is a sheer stamina thing. Maybe you're doing well when you work on individual verbal questions by themselves in little practice sessions. But when you're doing a full practice test, you're underperforming, well, maybe you just need to work on your stamina. You need to take longer practice sessions or work through longer sets of questions and build up your ability to stay focused because your performance on the verbal very much depends on your ability to stay focused and to actually learn what they're telling you in say a reading comprehension passage about the naked mole rat or what have you. You've got to actually learn something about it even if you don't get lost in the details. You still have to learn something so you can answer questions on it and that requires focus and concentration. If you're a perfectionist, that's your worst enemy for the GMAT because what happens is it's a time test and the test is going to adapt to your ability level. So, so you're really smart and you get, um, you get A's in school, right? You have a 3.9, 4, whatever it is, some high GPA. On the GMAT, the way it works is that it's impossible to get 90% correct because the test adapts to your ability. So whenever you get one or two or three right in a row, then you get a harder one and a harder one and a harder one. So at some point it goes above your ability level and you have to start getting some wrong. So, so you're probably only going to get, I don't know, 50, 60, 70%, right? You're never going to hit that level. So, so a lot of people that want to score high, they go into it with the mentality that's always worked for them, get 90% correct. If you go into the GMAT with that mentality, you don't finish it on time because you end up spending two, three, four, five minutes on a question and that gets you. If you are running out of time, then one of the best ways to make up time is to really learn your grammar rules so that you can get not only better but faster at sentence correction. Because it's hard to really rush reading comprehension and critical reasoning. It's hard to make your reading speed much faster than it is already. But one thing that we've found is that you can move the needle perhaps the most on sentence correction. That also helps you to read better because you understand the structure of sentences better. So that's a place to start. The way I like to think about the GMAT is you've got your content, you've got um, the process, the test taking process, and you've got your timing, those three areas. So, so for content, right, that's like you know, the learning the rules, what's a verb, what's a noun, right? You know, knowing how to use those in sentences. That's just a lot of heavy lifting. That's a lot of time it takes to go through and memorize that stuff, just hard work. The process, that's a little bit more art than science, and that's where taking a class can be very valuable. You can get the content out of a book, but to really get good at the nuances of the process, so like with sentence correction, okay? I read a sentence, what do I do? Do I read all the answer choices first? Do I read the sentence? Like, just all these procedural things, and it's on like the micro level of each topic, and it's also throughout the entire exam. If you get good at that process, 
that's really important and, and that's hard to get. A tutor or class can, can help you with that. Um, the timing, that a lot of it's just practice and, and those three things are all interrelated because you get good at the content, you learn that stuff, you're probably going to be faster. You get at the process, you're probably going to be faster. Um, I'd say tell students, try to separate out those three areas and really work hard on each and that's the best way to, to move your score up. Well, that's it for this edition of NBA Pod TV. I'm your host, Mia Saini. Visit us at nbapodcaster.com to get the latest audio and video shows. And of course, join us on Facebook and Twitter to get the latest news and insight into your NBA application process.